Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Christian Seltzer. I'm the founder and the president of the Convergence Initiative. And I'm extremely happy to be here uh, today for our second uh, colloquium of the series of Parallel Wars. Today, we are going through the subject of Crimson to talk about color, uh, the social construction, and everything that goes around this fascinating topic. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, Stefan Legari from the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and our guest today is Luis Gobro and Duanica Grips. So um, what we do is put together neuroscience and art, and this is what Convergence does, creating these collaborations. And I will pass the words to Stefan to introduce the museum. Thank you, Christian. Uh, my name is Stephen Legari. I'm a program officer for art therapy at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, as Christian said, what we're attempting to do in this series is bring you um, into the parallel worlds of neuroscience and the fine arts. And uh, this has been a, an incredible project that has taken shape over the last couple of years. And um, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's volunteer guide, Louise Gauvreau. I'm going to share with you her bio in just a moment, but also to say that if you've never had the pleasure of taking uh, a guided visit with one of our extraordinary volunteers, I'd like to let you know that it's more than just sharing information about the artworks that you encounter. It really is a creative act in and of itself. And um, our guides work very hard to not only educate and share and open up the fine arts to many people, but also to enter into dialogue. And that's a little bit about what we're trying to do today in a virtual version. Um, so I'm grateful to all the guides who have uh, volunteered to be part of this series and those that are also supporting their colleagues today. Without further ado, Louise Gauvreau is our Montreal Museum of Fine Arts volunteer guide today. She has an educational background that includes a Bachelor of Education with a major in physical education. She has also studied in radio and television, which gave her an opportunity to work as a talk show host. The field of communications opened up a range of new possibilities for her, and she went on to become a communications strategist later honing her skills abroad in both France and in Tanzania. In Tanzania is where she also went on to form a, a humanitarian foundation called Karibustana, whose mission is to restore the ecological balance of endangered Kikwati wildlife corridor. In her more recent capacity as a guide at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, she combines her training and love of education with her desire to communicate and transmit her passion for the fine arts Louise, thank you for being here and please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tall order and it's great. I'm very, um, uh, I feel very privileged to be with you today and I thank you all for making the time. It's a beautiful day outdoors. We'll make sure to keep you uh, inside or outside. I see some of you are um, and um, we'll release you in about an hour's time or so. Um, I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen with you. Uh, I would like to first uh, uh, um, put the emphasis on the fact that our presentation has to do with uh, Crimson Red, and I will introduce you to three artists that have three different works, and uh, we will discuss what red has, uh, what, what the effect of red on, on our, um, what impression red makes. Um, of course, uh, as uh, stories go, not all paintings will be read and we'll see why. So uh, just to add a little bit of uh, zest into the presentation. And I know that uh, Duenica Greaves is with us from London. Um, she will be uh, further talking about the impact of red on our brain. Uh, we will explore this with you, uh, Duenica, so thank you. So starting with um, this presentation. Here we go. So this is what we're doing. Oop. Our three artists are born in Canada. Not all of them um, uh, are, are Canadians rather, not all born in Canada. And um, here we go. And I hope you enjoy the next 20 minutes with me. 
Let's begin with our first artist, Maurice Cullen. The Impressionist painter was born in Newfoundland in Eastern Canada in 1866, and he grew up in Montreal. Now, what do you see in this painting? Sky, bottom, not, nothing is really clear. Uh, we notice a lack of definition since all colors are more or less in the same hues of pastels. Shapes are vague. Upon a second look, our eyes adapt to this camailleux of pastels, roses, timid yellows, faint mauves and blues with floating white patches at the forefront. Now, a second look may give us more insight into the painting. It allows our eyes to make sense of what is titled Quebec City from Livy. Now, not sure that all of you uh, are in Canada and not of you may not know this scene. Those of you who are familiar with the area will have recognized it, but otherwise, what is it exactly? Is it a mound? Is it a, a mountain? Is it something that is in the background? We're not sure. Where's Chateau Frontenac? It was built at the time. We don't see it. So um, Cullen uses pastel colors to paint an atmosphere. And um, the, colors, uh, Cullen, the colors Cullen chose are subdued, surprising, and they lend to a question, uh, to question the artist's intentions. Why this maelstrom of colors so faint that we cl can't clearly see? So Cullen uses pastels to cover an ambiance. The colors command a stillness. Colors create a sense of expectation. Beyond Cap Diamant, objects aren't defined. Cap Diamant, by the way, is what we see on the left. How colors, here colors confer an impression, an emotion. How do you feel when you observe this scene? What are your impressions? Cullen spent innumerable hours observing snow and ice, documenting the effects at different times of the day, in every season and various weather conditions. Cullen had a devouring passion for landscapes and scenes around Quebec City. Cullen's sketches were done outside, at times standing in his snowshoes. You can imagine him also eating a sandwich quickly before something happens and wanting to capture the, uh, the, the various weather um, uh, conditions. The clouds Cullen painted dominate the scene. Unhurriedly, we can see pinks, faint mauves, pale grays with yellows, a peach color and a twinge of orange to render what is most probably a sunset. So this is at the top of the uh, painting, as you can see. Cullen utilized the layering of color which is in pasto, which radiates light in the clouds. He prepared himself his pastels using clay and pigments designed in subtle variations. Immense and soft clouds. Are they going or coming in? It doesn't matter. Are they moving? We don't know. But what we know here is time stands still. What if Cullen would have used red instead of yellow? Here's a zoom in of the, whoop of the, uh, the clouds. Let's go back. So what if this scene would have been red at the bottom of the sky? What would our eyes make of a reddish flaming sunset, something vibrant, the color of passion, a daring sunset on a beach made for lovers? We have none of these flamboyant colors. In this painting, everything has to do with a soft spring day. Nothing hurried, nothing rushed. Looking at the reflection in the mauvish and brownish water, we can see the white and blue breakaway patches of ice and snow that make for a powerful rendition of spring gently inviting itself. The contrast of the pastels in the clouds of the clouds is dramatic. So when we look at the bottom and then when we look at the top, let's look, have a look at here at the, um, the reflection of the water. We can actually see the reflection of Cap Diamant, which is a mauveish on the left, top left or middle left. And, um, we can see that Maurice Cullen is working the Impressionism palette that he acquired in Paris's most reputed schools. He socialized with landscape artist Canadian William Brimner and James Wilson Morris. He also mingled with Bouguereau, Rodin, and poet Verlaine, and was influenced by Norwegian Impressionist Fritz Thalau. His technique consisted in using small regular strokes which rendered luminous representations, offering grandiose scenes. Let's go back whoop, to the top. You can see the small brush strokes here. One of Cullen's greatest success is his analysis of the effects of light that create atmospheric, almost evanescent views. 
Further to his European successes, Cullen exposed his works at the Montreal Art Association and few of his paintings were sold. Only collectors acquired them and they're very happy today. Cullen was perceived as audacious. And let me quote Cullen himself. Before that, I'll say that Cullen traveled in, as you know, as I said, uh, uh, Cullen studied in, in Paris, also uh, went to Italy, admired Vence's beautiful vistas, and even went to, uh, into the African continent. But let me quote Cullen, who insists on this scene. So having traveled to these countries, Cullen says, Levy's lower town offers the visitor one of the most beautiful visual perspective in the world. In one glance, the mountains, the river, and the port, Cap Diamant, and beautiful Quebec City offer a show of splendors, no less. So Quebec people are very proud of this right now. So um, we'll move on now with an abstract painting, a little more than a one foot by one foot by Fritz Brandner. Here we go. Where do your eyes naturally gravitate towards? Is it the combination of colors, perhaps one color in particular? Or is it the movement that grabs you? Perhaps all of the above, since there's definitely a lot of movement. Too much movement? Mm -hmm. Not for Brentner. He chose to paint this colorful piece. And our eyes seem to alternate between the many shapes and color and to make sense of it or not make sense of it. How do, you, how do you feel when you look at this painting? What emotion grabs you? This juxtaposition of all the colors and their incessant movement has a purpose. Whether it's simply a shape or whether you give it life is your interpretation. Emotion is personal. The effect differs from one person to another. Yet we can denote the swirl of this multitude of colors contains something dynamic, almost explosive yet contained. Remember, it's one foot by one foot. We're far from the previous painting with pastel colors making for a contemplation of clouds and a dramatic reflection of the water at the end of winter. Brandner's effect is powerful in a completely opposed spectrum. In the previous painting, Quebec City from Levy, we were in a meditative state, almost waiting for something to happen, ice to break ever so gently, water sinuously moving under the ice. In the storm right now, we have strong raging colors and a high movement that produce a totally different effect. Now, what does red produce as an effect? We know that the artist meticulously juxtaposed a few red patches on top of the other colors. And neuroesthetician Dr. Greaves will talk about the effect of color on our brain further into this presentation. We already know that though that red means something strong, it can be life, light or fire, death or blood. Western symbology expert Michel Pastourneau, Pastourneau rather, refers to red as the colors of all passions. Red is a specific code. Here, Brandner uses red on purpose. And what is the meaning of red here? Why so many colors? And is it order or disorder? Brandner's experience may suggest an answer. Born in 1896 in Germany, he enrolled at a young age in the German army for the First World War. He was captured and spent the rest of war in a French prison camp. This early experience had a profound impact on his work. And when Brandner eventually moved to Montreal, his work had in, was influenced by poverty, fascism, and war. So knowing Brandner's experience, a more defined interpretation may be suggested. This painting is an abstract representation of anger, of fury. When we look at the intertwined color, the swirl seems to take on a more definite shape and grow in importance. Red stands its ground amongst this roller coaster of color, or can those red splashes actually create the impetus? Is it the fire in the engine? Actually, this daring melting pot of black, white, blue, green, yellow, orange, and their nuances make up the perfect storm. We then can understand why the painting is called the storm. We look, um, the painting is non-dated non and we can look at Brantner's style of painting to assess the era of the work. Brantner's vividly colored work with his, its characteristic slashes and outlines of black is expressionist in tone. With, um, it's grounded in solid design and it shows the influence of the Bauhaus school. So there's a, there's a landmark. We can deduct that Brandner could have painted the storm anywhere between 1919 and 1937. The Bauhaus's references are clear in this painting. Geometric lines, 
abstract style featuring little sentiment or emotion and no historical nods. I may add to Brandner's poes, referring to painting a storm in a dimension of a little more than one foot by one foot. It's a powerful proposal like kinetic energy. And Brandner's passionate nature comes from honing his skill, skills with a post-impressionist master and focusing his apprenticeship on Amedeo Modigliani and Pablo Picasso. Although Brandner favored an international art that surpasses all borders, Brandner practiced social engagement at the local level, developing art education for underprivileged children. Brandner linked Canadians with the European avant-garde. He is credited with bringing expressionism to a wider audience in Canada. So we'll look here at the uh, swirl that I didn't really show you. So you can see the top swirl here with the red and we can see a close-up where we can appreciate the impetus that may, red may give here in the actually circle. And this is the bottom, so halfway through. Again, another movement and here, the crater, <laughs> the bottom, another swirl of red. So this is for Brandner. We're going to change completely, uh, style, completely uh, st the style, the atmosphere and the color. We're going to the beach, uh, interesting proposal. So we are with Helen Galloway McNichol with a figurative painting called Under uh, the Shadow of the Tent. What does this painting confer as opposed to the previous painting? The painting definitely has soft colors. It's a peaceful scene and the scenery is ba based in, basked in sun sunlight. We can observe a style and tone very different than the storms. McNichol's style instills calm and quietness. In the back, the soft yellow is filled with brightness. At the forefront, the light breaks through timidly as the tent provides a protective shield. McNichol has a special gift to capture light and it had to do with her condition. At the age of two, she, got, she caught the scarlet fever which left her deaf. However, she was able to pursue her career, her dream of becoming an artist thanks to her parents who had very good means. And her deafness conferred her the unique ability to capture specific moments as she herself lived, lived in a world of silence. One can almost feel the heat of the sun in the back where bathers enjoy the freshness of the water. Yet the high horizon line brings these two women, women close to us in the intimacy of their everyday life, almost as if the beach is exclusively theirs. McNichol was described as the painter of sunshine. Her work was really characterized by sunlight um, from A to Z. Under the shadow of the tent is typical of hers, an everyday scene rendered magical, intimate, happy, yet for the privileged where she came from. Now, what do the colors tell us? Impressionist Helen McNichol depicts a scene of the feminine condition of the times. She uses light colors, shadows with warm tonalities, and an overhead view of the two women concentrate trading on their activities to convey intimacy. They seem peaceful, they're silent. Remember, McNichol lived in a world of silence. They're to themselves in their own content bubble, which is probably connected with McNichol's deafness and her capacity to use the light to confer mood in this chosen context. In a way similar to Maurice Cullen's, remember the first painting with the huge clouds, Impressionist McNichol uses color, a brush stroke, and a theme familiar to many French Impressionists, the seaside. Notice at the forefront, the crisp white dress of the young women with soft hues of yellows, blues, and pinks. The woman sitting on a chair wears a blue dress. Blue is calming, almost like an echo to the sea at the top. We relate to this scene, to these objects, because we associate them with those colors. What if the red was dress? What if the dress was red? That's my I'm sure. Twist. What impact would it have? How would it affect this tranquil, quill moment at the beach? Would all the colors still fit for a perfect day at the beach? Or would it be an odd splash of red unrelated to this serene scenery? Can you find some red objects or subjects in this painting? So uh, the patches of red are selectively positioned, more subtle than, than with Brandner. At the bottom left, so let's go here at the top and we'll go at the bottom left. Two red lines traverse what looks like a piece of on the ground. 
further in the back, still in the shadow on the ground, we can distinguish a very small red spot on the left. I'm stretching this a little bit, red wine, let's say. And the delicate red lips of the two women. Oh, in the back as well, here there's a bather with a bit of red on the left and red on the right, orangey red or red orangey. And um, we can look at the women at the top here. So her red lip and with the young women too, we can see the red lips, the red cheek, and even at the back, some hues of, of red here. And all of this contribute to the brightness of the painting. Helen McNichol in, in the back as well here. Helen McNichol studied with outdoor impressionist William Bribner at Montreal's Fine Art Association before studying in Paris and in London. McNichol's art is fitting with the tradition of impressionist women such as Berthe Morisot and Mary Cassatt. McNichol was able to impose her art and to influence the scene who was almost exclusively male at the time. A pioneer of women's emancipation in Canadian art at the turn of the 20th century, Helen Galloway McNichol paved the way for the new women of the modern era. And in closing, we can see that red has a purpose, a meaning in a painting. Meditative and quietness doesn't call for red. Let's go back to the top without you being too, too dizzy. Yeah. So no red here. Maurice Collins Quebec City from Levy stayed away from red. He chose pastels to form rich and soft colors and impressions. With Cullen, we seem to be gently invited in the scene. Impetus, close your eyes. <laughs> Noise and fury likes red. Fritz Brandner chose red to add vibrant movement, like free electrons. We seem to be attracted in this movement, malgré nous, unintentionally. And close your eyes again. See, this is a participatory uh, exercise. Gentle Victorian and proper bourgeoisie at the beach enjoys a tad of red, which adds sophistication. Helen McNichol caught this impression. She lived in a world of silence and mostly depicted her social world. Red can excite, add flair, or be associate, say, associated with the red light district. It's all a matter of dosage, of punctuation, and of purpose. I thank you. Merci. Thank you so much, Luis, for this fantastic presentation. Oh, I just I just love how much I discover every time I, I listen to you guys uh, or I observe a painting when you discover all these little details or how the color is here or there and seeing that you seen that they were not contained in the painting, you still have all these elements. So this is just wonderful, fantastic. I so, discovered a few things too. <laughs> yes, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> so what we will do now is we will pass, I want to introduce Duonica Graves, but before to do that, I just would like to um, thanks to uh, sponsors because we are doing this thanks that we have many people supporting us. And among these people, of course, is the uh, brain program of the McGill University Health Center. So the brain program is, a, is an institute in the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center that have more than 120 labs that dedicate to do research in neuroscience in many, many topics of neuroscience. And this uh, center is here in Montreal. So if you have the opportunity, check their website to learn more what they are doing. Uh, I would like also to thanks to Healthy Brain, Healthy, Healthy Life from McGill. That is um, it's a, a found from Canada first uh, research and excellence found, which has uh, given us funds to do many of the activities that we are doing today, like the creation of our beautiful website, and put all the information together to Concordia University. Of course, thanks to them, we are meeting in this virtual uh, setting. So the Faculty of Fine Art is sponsoring us with these fantastic uh, colloquiums and series and to the Canadian Association of Neuroscience for their continual supporting of convergence since the creation in 2016. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, just. I have two screens and usually when I get two screens, I just get all scrambled. There you go. Now I can see everything. 
So our next speaker is Gronica Graves. And she's right now in London, UK, not London, Ontario. So it's a little bit further. <laughs> 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 and Gronica is a neurosthetician. So which is a big word for someone that study how art impact our brain and what are the processes that are happening in our brain when we experience art. And these can be paintings, uh, theater, dance, music, any type of art. So what happened in our brain and how we are just very recently start to study what our brain does, what seems, you know, connections and all that. And Dronica studied precisely that. She did her bachelor in psychology uh, degree at City University of London, where she studied effects of mood induction on emotional perception of movement stimuli. And then uh, she graduated as a master in psychology of the arts in the neurosthetics and creative program, which is pretty, pretty recent uh, in, in this university in London. Uh, and one of the first I've seen in the world also, where she studied the constructive dreams, the effects of audience, particip audience participation and audience engagement in theatrical performance. What is even more happy of all these things that Dominica has already done is that she's now part of the PhD master in, in philosophy and PhD in cognitive neuroscience where she will continue studying neurosthetic and she just told us that she have found it now. So congratulations, we are really happy for you because we will have a fantastic neurosthetician uh, to continue learning about how our brain get affected by art and how it can um, help us and uh, benefit. So, Dominica, the stage is all yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for inviting me. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And Louise, thank you so much for your incredible talk. I learned so much and I was so fascinated looking at all the paintings and just the associations that you found with red and without red as well. And I love how the first painting, as we stared at it, and even when we went back, I could see more than what I saw before and I thought that was absolutely incredible. So, so perfect to begin what I'll be talking about. So I will share my screen. Um, okay. So here we go. I'm going to jump straight into it. So of course you just heard a bit about my background, but just to um, clarify, I don't actually study colour per perception, I obviously study performing art. So the question is, what am I going to do today? Um, so what I will be doing is I will be deconstructing studies on colour perception and making inferences to answer the main questions that we have today. And I'll show you the main question in a second. And I'd like to say that the content from this talk is actually inspired by one of the lectures that I had on the MSc programme as well um, by Dr Rebecca Chamberlain. And also a book that I read, Aesthetic Science, which I actually highly recommend for anyone that wants to know more about aesthetic science and especially um, colour perception, as we'll be talking about today. But also I wanted to talk about my work in itself and the fact that I actually use colour colour in, in my work because I love taking photography of nature and architecture as well. So it's just interesting to see how we can use colour in our day to day lives outside of, for example, research as well. So. Here is the question for today. Is colour preference a social construct? And I will be exploring this at the same time as everybody else as well. So we're, we're all on the same page and I'll do my best to deconstruct the studies that I'll be looking at today. But firstly, I want to say, OK, where do we see colour in our world? Firstly, I included flags. And this is a flag of the island that I was born in, Montserrat. And the reason why I included this flag is because the green on the dress of Lady Erin here shows the Irish heritage that my island has. And then I also added Dominica as well, because Dominica has a purple that you can see here in the flag. And there are only two flags in the world that actually have that colour purple, simply because it was extremely rare and extremely expensive. So just by looking at flags, we can see um, historical um, heritage connotations. We can also see specific colours are used for a specific reason, because they show something, how purple is associated with royalty. Why do only two flags in the world have that color purple? It's just really, really interesting. But we can also see here that we use color in signs. We use color for survival, to navigate around our world. But then we can also see that we use color in what we wear, how we present ourselves. But also, this is a Versace, this is, um, 
this is this year's spring summer line and this is last year's autumn winter line and just seeing how color corresponds with the seasons as well but also corresponds with material and with patterns so it's just really interesting to think about we see color all the time but when you actually realize that we use it for survival as well it's just really really interesting so in essence we have basically associated meanings to wavelengths if you really want to break down what we've done that's what we've actually done and it's quite interesting in this chart here you can see some of the stereotypical associations that are associated with specific colors and that we can see here red the color of today danger passion daring romance it's just really interesting why is that not white why is that not green um connotations and preferences though they can't be generalized across cultures or individuals and we'll look at these studies to find out why but it's quite interesting because perhaps in european cultures red might mean something compared to non-European culture. So it's just really interesting to bear that in mind as well. And also my favorite color might not be the same thing as your favorite color as well. So it's, even if we are in a specific culture and, and that culture might have a stereotype, like say my island, green is in our national dress, but it doesn't mean that green is my favorite color. So once again, is color then a social construct? So as I said, one of the questions that I had myself was, how did these colors get their connotations? I, I actually don't know. And the studies I'll be looking at today don't actually answer that question. But what we will be looking at today is why do we have these color preferences? So researchers within aesthetic science, they have aimed to explore this. So we're just gonna break down what they actually did to get there and what we can infer from these studies. So this is the first study that I'm going to be looking at today. And these researchers, they conducted a three part study to actually clarify the relationship between color emotion and color preference. So this study is more of an assumption as to how we can predict color preferences due to color attributes. So certain words that we associate with certain colors. And it's a three part study, but I'll only be focusing on two parts of the study and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So the aim of part one of the study was to, so they conducted a psychophysical experiment to clarify the relationship between color emotions and color apparent attributes. So they investigated 10 color emotion factors. So we can see here the 10 different factors that they use and the word that modern and classical, active and passive and hard and soft. And we can, when we say these words to ourselves, perhaps we even think of colors in our heads that actually match some of these words. So looking at the actual study itself. So this study was conducted on British and Chinese participants. And what's interesting to note is that the members were shown the definition of each of the words in the color pairs that you saw before, which is quite good to know because since color is a social construct and words are social constructs as well, really thinking about linguistics in this study, it's good that participants are on the same page because hard and soft might mean different things to different cultures as you will see later on in the study. And what they used was they used 20 colors selected from the NCS color atlas and they range in hue, lightness and chroma. So you can kind of see here the different range of colors that they use and we see our color of the day right here, red. And these 20 colors were shown on a three by three patch with a gray background in a dark room. And the participants had to choose which word in the color emotion word pair best suited the color that they were observing. And then they were asked verbally by the experimenter and their responses were verbal. So it's really interesting to note that this was a verbal study. It wasn't a study where they had to do self-report measures in silence, which is, I'm quite accustomed to that, but they actually had to say out loud what their favorite color was. I mean, not their favorite color, sorry, what, their, what word they thought associated to a specific color to the experimenter. So what did they find? So there were two different things that they were looking at here. So observer accuracy was the within group comparison. So for example, British participants compared to other British participants. And then color emotion ratings were the between group comparisons, so British participants compared to Chinese participants. So within observer accuracy, looking at the color emotion word pairs, they found that heavy to light had the highest accuracy value. So within each group, everybody thought the same colors were heavy and light, which is quite interesting. And also this was found, well, actually no, the opposite was found for tense and relaxed. So that actually had the lowest accuracy. A value. So within groups, let's say men compared to men, didn't think that the same colors were associated with the words tense and relax. Really interesting. We can already see the variations within words we can associate with certain colors. So to really break that down, so looking at gender, females had higher accuracy values than males. So 
females compared to females, they thought the same colors had the same kind of words associated with them compared to males compared to males. So looking at culture, both accuracy values were similar apart from hard and soft, which is quite interesting to see that variance within these cultures comparing themselves to each other. Now looking at color emotion ratings and looking at gender again, there was actually no significant gender differences in color emotion ratings, which is quite interesting. So across males and females, the significant level basically found that the colors that they thought, let's say, was heavy and light were quite similar across the different genders. And then with culture, though, it was actually quite different. So tense and relaxed, there was a difference specifically for the color black. And then in light, dislike, there was a difference for the color deep purple. And just to visualize this even more, zooming into tense, relaxed, and light, dislike. So for British participants, like is close to colors that were rated cool. So researchers concluded that British participants prefer cooler colors. So we can kind of see that over here in the plot. And for Chinese participants, like was closer to colors that were rated clean, fresh, and modern. And then for British participants, colors that were rated tense were actually more closer to colors that were, related, were rated active. So we can see that there. And then for Chinese participants, tense is close to colors that were rated hard, heavy, and masculine. So that's right over there. So what research actually did with this, because when looking at preferences is actually to try and create these prediction models that, that can be used in other studies, as we, as we will see. So they ran a factor analysis on eight color emotions, but they excluded like this, like intense, relaxed because of the differences. And they created three factors. So we can actually see here, and now we can actually see clearly the colors that were used as well in the study. And I'll pop the three factors and you can see the different color pairs that landed within each of these factors to create this preference prediction model. But here is the thing, as we saw in the patents earlier, we don't see singular colors in our world. We actually see colors simultaneously. And I think that's just really interesting to think because when I read the first study, I didn't even think of that. But when I was reading their um, conclusions, I was like, that's so true. That is so true. You wouldn't just see a standalone color unless perhaps you walk into, you know, like in photography, you walk into the white rooms or the, the, bl the black rooms and it's just one color. But we don't really see that as we maneuver around our world. And that's where part two comes in. So they kind of conducted the same study, similar procedure, same participants, but a lower participant pool number. But this time they decided to use color pairs. And they used the 11 color emotion, emotion scale. So the same word pairs as before, but this time they included harmonious and disharmonious, which makes sense because now we're looking at more than one color. What did they find? So looking at the within group comparisons, we see here that looking at gender, females had higher accuracy levels than males. And then with culture, both accuracy values were similar, which is not actually what we saw before because there was a difference. And looking at color emotion ratings between group comparisons, we see that for gender, like and dislike, was in females proponent two, but males proponent three. So you can see that here. And this was because researchers said that females associated like with the color pairs that were soft, relaxed, light or feminine, but this association wasn't seen with males. And there was no plot, so I, I couldn't plot it out to show you here, but there will be a plot for the culture on where with um, hard and soft, modern, classical, tense and relaxed, we're in different component groups. So for example, Hard soft was in component one for British participants. However, it was in component two for Chinese participants, which is quite interesting to see that difference. And here I said, I promise you some more plots. So here we go. So British participants associated hard with color pairs that were active or tense. And we can see that here. And Chinese participants associated hard with color pairs that were heavy masculine or tense. So we can see that there. And then once again, researchers decided to create a model and they ran a factor analysis on eight color emotions and they excluded like dislike and created these three factors. So we can see the colors more clearly and the pairs that they were put with as well. And I will show the, the factors that they came up with, but we see a difference right here. If we compare, so this was part one, we see tense and relax made it into color weight and here it wasn't there. So it's quite interesting to see what happens when we add another color to colors that are already seen. So we go back to our question of the day. Is color preference a social construct? 
and this is my inferences from the study, so it's not what the study concluded, but I just ripped these studies apart and started thinking for myself. And I was like, you know what? Words and their meanings are socially constructed. So maybe color preference is a social construct because for example, I highlighted these specific words, modern and classical. As we go through the ages, what is modern and what is classical will change. Masculine and feminine. As we go through the ages, we see that what we think is masculine or feminine can be interchangeable and can change. Or even like and dislike, as we go through the lifespan, what we like and what we dislike will change. And then part two, so preferences for standard on colours are not the same when that colour is in a pair. And colour associations are then dependent on the colours that surround it. And it's quite interesting because it's like our colours, it's like they're human because our behaviour sometimes depends on what's around us. And now looking at colours, what a colour kind of gives off to an individual depends on what other colours surround it. And I just thought that was a really interesting concept. So this study sheds light on properties of colour that affect our preferences. but we still need to answer why. It doesn't actually give us a, a theoretical explanation as to why. We have to infer that. So hence why I had to, as in another study, and this is the ecological balance theory, and this theory says that colour preferences are determined by people's effective responses to objects of a specific colour, not the direct responses to colours. So, for example, I like strawberries, therefore I like red. I don't like Brussels sprouts, so therefore I don't like that shade of green. So that's what this theory argues and it argues that it's not the opposite way which is quite interesting and the basis of this framework is has an evolutionary premise so color preferences are adaptive and learning mechanisms modify our color preferences and this starts from infancy and establishes itself in early adulthood so we can start thinking about social co constructions here as well and then it has an emotional premise where effective balances across po positive and negative underlie these color preferences so we like colors that benefit our well-being I'm like, maybe they're onto something. As you can see, I'm surrounded by a pink wall. I love pink and it makes me feel great. So maybe I like pink because I feel great when, when, when I'm around it, which is quite interesting. So here we see they use a, a big group of participants. So the first group of participants did a colour preference, colour appearance and colour emotion task. And I will explain what they are in a second. Second group did object description task. Another group did balance rating task and colour object matching task. So to explain what that is, so the colour preference task, on, they had to rate colours on a scale of how much they liked them, from not at all to very much. Then the colour appearance task was rated on scales such as reds, green, yellow, blue, light, dark, and saturated, desaturated. The colour emotion task was the, like the previous study that we saw. Object description task, so participants were placed in six groups of 11 to 13 people and were instructed to write the name or brief description of as many objects that had that colour in 20 seconds and a balance rating task, so then participants were presented with the categories of object descriptions and had to rate their emotional responses to each object from negative to positive. And then lastly, they did a colour object matching task, so rate how much that colour matched the object. What did they find? So their findings actually led to another formula. We see another model that's been used here. So I'm not going to deconstruct the, the model. I don't have all that knowledge on that, but I can tell you what each segment means. So WCO is the average color object match value for each pairing of a color, which is C, and object description, which is the O. VO is the average balance rating given to an object. NC is the number of color descriptions that are given to each color. But what we're really looking at here is, okay, so they ran the regression on their model and models from previous research and found that. So this model, I didn't talk about it, but this model, took 37% of the variance. And then there's a colour appearance model, which they actually made from participants' average ratings of dimension and saturation of these colours, took 60% of the variance. Now our previous study took 55% of the variance. But what we see here is that their model made 80% of their variance. So it's, it's causing us the question, do we prefer colours because we like objects? And thinking about the study before, or do we prefer certain colours because of the words that are put there? It's quite an interesting thing to think about. So back to our question, is colour preference a social construct? So what we see here from this study, they actually did a follow-up study. So in this study, they had American participants. But what they did was they conducted a study six years later with Japanese participants. And what they found was that the waves for the American participants were better at predicting American colour preferences. And then the waves for Japanese color pref um, just uh, Japanese participants, sorry, predicted Japanese color preferences better than if it was to predict American color preferences. 
That's really interesting. And now looking at subcultures, then they did a study where they tested students from Berkeley and Stanford's color preferences in relation to university colors. And students prefer the colors associated with their university. And their preference increased with the amount of self-reported school spirit that they had. So the more affiliated they felt with the university, the more they liked the colors. And the argument is, okay, they like the colors because they like the university, which is quite interesting. So it's argued that they didn't choose the university because of the colors, if that makes sense. So it's just a really interesting thing to think about because you think to yourself, but are there not objects that I like because I like the colour? For example, my, my water bottle here is pink and I'm pretty sure I chose it because I like pink. <laughs> I didn't um, like water bottles and water bottles just so happen to be pink. So it's just a really interesting thing when you think about yourself in, in the world that you live in today. So finally, just looking at what I was talking about as a whole, our big question is colour preference a social construct. First study I looked at, so the words that we use to describe colour characteristics are social constructions, as language and definitions are constructed by society. And secondly, we see colours simultaneously, so our preferences of a colour may be dependent on the other colours that surround it. And then with the study we just looked at, the ecological balance theory, if colour preferences are influenced by our like or dislike of an object, that could also be a social construction, perhaps. As preferences on objects change through life as we adapt to our environment, as we live through life, we see different objects. Quite interesting, as the paintings before, as Louise was saying, the paintings were inspired by different areas as well. So it's just interesting to think about that. And lastly, culture and subgroups can affect our colour preferences, which ultimately is, is a social construction. So. Thank you very much for listening. And this is, I, I needed to add this picture because it was the installation that I saw in um, Greenwich in London called Hundreds and Thousands by artist Liz West. And I absolutely loved it because there's so much color that, that is within it. And I just thought I had to, to just add that to, to end the talk today. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope, I hope it made some, some sense. So yes, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. So, so cool. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> so, um, as you know, now, uh, let me just pin our presenters today. There's, and then I'm gonna pin also, um, yeah, there we go. I'm gonna pin myself, I think that goes. So you see the four of us, and then we have everybody in the side here. So. There is the chat where you can start to post your questions. Uh, also, we have questions for you guys. And also, if you have questions to each other, also they are like welcome to uh, go ahead, Luis and Daunica. And I have, oh, we have already a question in the chat. This is awesome. I love that. So this is from CLA. Uh, could you repeat the reference at the beginning of the talk on neuroesthetics? Rebecca? Yes. So um, so the reference that I had for Dr. Rebecca Chamberlain was actually a lecture on objective aesthetics and status, static stimulus properties. But the lecture obviously is not accessible. Um, it, it was a lecture that was done in when I was a student there. But I will write Dr. Rebecca's name in the chat as she's a researcher in visual arts. Uh, I think everyone can see that and definitely research her work as well. And actually I'll paste the, the book that gives more information because the lecture as well was inspired by the book. So uh, there you go. I think everyone can see that. Fantastic. So Carlota Di Fiore asked where the participant tested prior to the study if any of them were colorblind? From the top of my head, I think they were. I think when it, when it comes to these studies, they first they had color training and they, I think that's a, so they understood what the colors were. They understood what the words were. They all had corrected vision, if that if that made sense. So either like glasses or 2020 vision, but they could see the colors and perceive them. I think the hues about a, a similar way because if the participants were colorblind, it would completely change the um, what what the study's about. Then you would be comparing um, color perception in people that are not colorblind and are colorblind. That's like that will create a whole different study and a whole different um, confounding variable actually within this study. So they had um, normal to corrected vision. 
Uh, we have also a question for Marguerite uh, Dorion. In art therapy, they associate colors to emotions. What do you think of these tendencies? Is that for me? Is it? Is, yes, I can so, feel I can feel that if you want. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm an I art therapist. Mind, but yeah, go on. <laughs> no, please, oh, Duenica, please. Why, um, so the the notion that uh, we associate uh, colors with emotion, I think, comes back to the the lecture, the presentation that we just got. Is that this these are um, influenced by many factors, including um, preference, culture, um, history. Um, the object uh, onto which or in which they are created. So I have an orangish painting behind me. I love it. Uh, it was actually created by an art therapist. And um, I'm now looking at it completely differently because I'm seeing the colors at once that surround it. So is that preference for the orange color or is the orange now being influenced by the colors around it? And I'm reflecting on uh, my emotional response to it. So yes, it does elicit feelings but it also has sentiment because I care for the person that created it. So the object has um, more than uh, a, a single uh, emotional relationship. It has all of that information associated with it as well. So my biased opinion is this, there are definitely emotional associations with color, um, but I would love uh, for our neuroscience guest and our guide to uh, reflect on that question as well. I think there definitely is. I don't know why. I said, I feel like there, there may be research out there that may answer that. And I just want to link that as well with the why in India is the color white for funerals and the color for funerals in other places black. And I think what's interesting is maybe there is a study like that. So obviously forgive me if, if someone in there knows already, but it's interesting to ask participants or maybe not even that, maybe anthropologists perhaps could conduct studies in that kind of social getting that social content from people and tracing back into histories to find out why because when you're looking when you're doing a study on neuroscience you can find what areas of the brain are elicited when you do this kind of psychological studies you find out what people like but in terms of the whys you have to get more social more anthropological with the type of research that you basically um create as well so that like we know the emotions are there we know that we've associated something to these wavelengths as i was saying before but the why question actually takes I feel like it takes a big interdisciplinary, um, interdisciplinary yeah, approach to a research project. So yeah. I, I would like to add something to that. One of the most interesting things that you can find in the research uh, of neuroesthetic is that many of the, the um, emotions that get triggered and with this, the feelings that we get triggered are related to the memories that are stories and experiences mm -hmm. in the person that is experienced the art or in this case, the color. So something that is very, very important is the setting where this person associate is one of these colors or is one of the experiences because then in the future is gonna trigger some kind, in some degree, those emotions. So memories are super, super important. Luis, you want to add? Can, can you repeat the question? I've, I've listened to the answers and I, I would like to go back to the, the question, if you may. The question was, uh, that's the question. Oh, in art therapy, they associate colors to emotions. What do you think of these tendencies? The tendency? Yeah, to associate colors to emotions. Mm. Um, I think it's right um, when you look at, for instance, um, colors uh, in hospitals, they tend to, the walls tend to be green and, and blue and very soft. Um, and so we want people to be calm. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, some people uh, have changed in my, my, when I moved in my uh, house in years ago in, in Toronto, the, the wall was red and I painted it white and then it was too white. I went back to red and I thought, no, 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 it's too much. So it was triggering something for me at first and I, I wanted to, to, to um, uh, uh, relate to the, the color that I love, but it was, it was just too much. I think it's, it's better on a lipstick or a piece of clothing, but a whole wall, no. So I think it's, 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 it's very, uh, the, the, the discussion that uh, Dwenika, you, you, you brought about with the different uh, sensations or the different um, impressions, soft, tense, heavy, um, 
uh, masculine, all these adjectives to um, qualify color uh, is, is, is very apropos and, uh, and, and trigger obviously different uh, impressions. What I was wondering, Duanika, is, is the soft and, and active and tense for me as a, a Caucasian mean the same thing as say a, a Chinese participant in that, that do, the, do we have the same interpretation? I of, think of these so, adjectives. Yeah, so with this study, as I said, even though, okay, they knew what the word meant according to English, but what the study actually showed in terms of results is that it was different because the where it was on the plots in terms of like and dislike and what colours were in those groups of hard and soft or passive and active was different for for certain studies according to gender and in certain studies according to culture if that makes sense so there was even if they all knew the same meaning of the word according to the dictionary definition the results still showed some kind of difference as well and I also wanted to add onto the question that we're discussing as well one of the models that I didn't talk about but I did mention um, was the cone contrast model and they have a, re a very evolutionary premises on, on their argument saying that what they found was in their study, women preferred reddish colors. And they said that was because back in, in the day, they were the hunters and they had to look for the healthier berries. And what I remember from this lecture as well was that um, you prefer a specific color because it represents health. Because if you were a hunter, for instance, something that's bright and red was perhaps healthy, maybe not poisonous, etc. So that was their argument. Um, based on like ancestry, uh, you know, back in the day, kind of um, prehistoric um, practices. And we could see in itself, that's a social construction because I mean, you can't use that as an explanation as to why perhaps if, say I like pink, but say my, my sister hates pink, <laughs> if that makes sense. So you can't- But, but you, you don't hate your use, sister. <laughs> uh, but I don't, exactly, but I don't hate my sister. So it, it's very, um, really, really um, interesting. But yeah, <laughs> I've got a I've got a question here for both of you, uh, and it comes from Darian. Um, what was the most surprising thing that each of you found in your research in preparing for this presentation? I'm sure there's many surprising things, mm -hmm. but um, what stands out for both of you is something really surprising in your research preparation. Duenica, you go first. Okay, so for me, it was I think it was the ecological balance theory and just the fact that. Because I like this object means that I like this color. And especially the follow-up study on universities where because you go to that university, you, you like that color. And they said that you wouldn't um, choose a university based on a color. Now I'm a person that's very aesthetic and I do like colors. <laughs> As you can see, I've got quite a bit of colors on me today. And I feel like, like I gave you my water bottle explanation. I'm not saying I would choose a university based on the color, but I do actually think about my aesthetic surroundings. I do actually think about, okay, I would choose a pink pen over a blue pen. Like I would choose a pink bag over, over a red bag. So I feel like there are some things that we choose because of the color, not necessarily the object. Like perhaps I don't like, um, say I don't like hair scrunchies. In fact, this is actually true. I never wore hair scrunchies. It's really random because I just saw it on my desk. But there was a pink hair scrunchie and it was really nice. And I bought the hair scrunchie because it was pink. And now <laughs> I quite like hair scrunchies. So it's just really interesting to see that as we live our lives, we can, we can see where this fairy is coming from, but we can also see that the opposite can kind of happen as well. So I find that quite interesting. Uh, I find it interesting uh, to, to, to these associations are fascinating actually and I, I find when I, I realized that I went to McGill and McGill's um, blazon or McGill's um, uh, logo is red uh, I'm, I'm not surprised it's a color that that I find fascinating what I found very interesting in, in the the research that I did or the yeah the research is um, uh, the world that, that uh, Ellen Galloway lived in was a world of silence and that she used very little red. And of course it was, it was her times. Um, 
uh, red was, you know, whoever wore red dress was probably the red light district. District. So um, that again, going back to what you said, Duenica, uh, color as a social construct um, in, in those days, in the Victoria, Victorian era, um, colors were soft and um, uh, you wanted to, to, to be belong to that, that society. You wanted to um, associate with, 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 with your times and with your, your, your class really, where, where you were, were from. So um, I found that there was a, a, a combination of, of um, color, choosing colors for, for Big Nickel and as well as living in her world make her even reflect more on, on the rest such as, uh, such as sunlight and, and brightness. And in other words, if, and, and that's another question, but if we had, if we could cut off one sense to, to privy another sense, how much more do, could we acquire? How much more sensible and sensitive could we be? Not simple, but sensitive could we be? Um, when it, it's often said that we use only so much percentage of our brain, and I believe so, because obviously her brain was more evolved than mine to be able to, or let's say to another than another artist who uh, had all his or her senses. She came up with something very particular the, the, the creation of her capacity to create a bubble um, gave her a special gift. And, and that's really extraordinary when we think of it. Uh, it, it, it brings us to um, a balance of, of, of things and people. In other words, uh, a handicap, let's, let's put it this way, or, or a person that has, um, let's call it a handicap, is a, a flower, a flower. So a person with a handicap may, uh, and, and probably will develop some other qualities. And, um, uh, as we say in French, la vie est bien faite. Life is, 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 finds its, its balance in, in a way. Louis, to, to me, surprised me a lot. I'm, I mean, I was so happy when we had Mike Nicol in the tour uh, because I, I had the, the honor to see the, um, the exhibition of the Beaver Hall, and she was one of the, the painters of the Beaver Hall. Uh, so when, when we have her work inside the tour, it was like, yay, we have one of her beautiful paintings. But today, when you say that she was there, this adds like a 300 points to how interesting her character was. Like, it was really cool. I, I learned that with you today. Can you imagine what happens in her brain and, 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 and all the, 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 how do you, how do you call them, the little, uh, I forget how to call it in English, what happens in your, in your eyes when you, that's all you can, you can do is, is look yeah. and be totally focused on, 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 on looking. And that's what, why we say, uh, I remember somebody told me years ago, a friend of my brother who lived in England years ago, um, she said, when you, you want to look at a painting, you sit down for two hours. And I thought, I can't do that. I love painting, but I, I love art, but I can't do that. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous and it's not. <laughs> but again, I was 20 years younger, so. <laughs> that's what interesting to me also, like, when I wanted to paint something, I, I realized like years ago when I started to paint things that would be just a flat color. So I would say, oh, okay, the, the, the sky is blue, and I would paint it blue. Today, when I want to paint the sky and I see to observe the, the sky, I take a photograph or something, I realize that it's not just blue. It's like many other colors there, and maybe it's not just blue, blue, but it's a little bit greenish or a little bit uh, reddish. And is that capacity of observation, like, Magnicol has it because she didn't have, right, like she was deaf, but all, we can all develop it, like she and observe things and realize that it's so much content and so much things hiding there in front of your eyes. So I, I, I find that extremely interesting and even kind of mystical to just be in there to discover these secrets that are in front of you in the color. It, it reminds me of, um... Uh, Turner, who was, um, no, his works were presented at, at Quebec City, and I was privy to go with my uh, eldest sister there back in March. And uh, it was extraordinary to, 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 to see how Turner observed nature and was able to, to paint such glow, such immense beauty. And uh, he was a peu un poco loco. Uh, he 
wanted to, he, he loved um, uh, fishing and he, was at, he asked one of his friends to tie him at the top of a mast in, and to go in a storm so that he, he would really feel the storm. You can imagine what the next painting looked like. Um, so he really wanted to feel. So in other words, he wanted to extend this, not only his, his perception, but his impression. I have another question for both of you. If you'd like to take a, a, a little deep dive into meaning making, this one comes from Nora. Um, and I think that you can both uh, approach this question from your, your respective experience and expertise. So I'll jump to the end of the question that frames it really well. Do we carry around an infinite possible number of meanings in association with color? Um, and uh, they give you the example of, so supposing we're in front of a painting that is predominantly lavender mm -hmm. and we share with the viewer or the participant, well, this lavender painting is about loss. And then we move to another painting that also has the predominant color of lavender. And we say to the participant, to the viewer, well, this painting, this is about the sublime. This is the example that they use. Mm -hmm. And the question then is, what does the brain do with these non-correlative associations with the color lavender? So can we carry around these infinite number of associations? Um, I'd love to hear from either you or both of you about that question. Duenica, you alluded to that when you mentioned that we have an association with, with, with the color. You, you like pink. Um, I, can't, I can't only imagine what kind of... Uh, lollipop you enjoyed when you were younger or what, <laughs> what kind of chocolate you enjoyed. <laughs> but uh, I think that we have um, s s as, many, as, as, as many people that, that there are that have a, a meaning for one color, I, can, I think we can have several meanings actually, um, especially if we're influenced by our different experiences then uh, red takes on a, a, a different color or blue or green. Um, I don't know what the, what the brain makes of it. It, it probably creates a bit of chaos to have uh, opposite, let's say, uh, feelings about about a color, or um, you know, can 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 pink be this beautiful? Uh, let's let's talk about uh, yellow. Can this yellow field be magical because of all the flowers? But can yellow be associated with a um, something that we see catching on fire? So, so these are two opposite um, impressions or actually realities. And we, we make sense of the fire and the beautiful field. Um, I don't know, does, does, is, does it work with our synapses? Is that where we have uh, <laughs> some lesions that are... <laughs> I would <laughs> say that. <laughs> I'm being facetious. <laughs> no, I no, I would say that with the ecological violence theory as well, there was actually another follow-up that I would have included and they found that individual waves, so the model that they made predicted, of course, your color preference is better than somebody else's. So of course, you know, by default, we do have different associations with different colors. Yes, we might have the cultural one as a whole, because for example, we saw a study, yeah, based in America, but then we also saw a focus looking at subcultures of universities. So I think I was even saying it, I think it was at the beginning of my talk, or even prior to the talk, where it's like, yes, you might be in a country, but your color preferences might not be the same as your colors. I think it was maybe the green when I was like, my my island that I'm from is, is really green, really luscious, has a lot of Irish heritage. And I love, I love emerald because it's the emerald out of the Caribbean. I, I love emerald. And I'm like, do I love emerald because of that connection with the island, or did I would I have loved Emerald if it if it wasn't for that? And I think in the brain, we definitely do have all these associations. But what's nice is that I feel like they're all there, perhaps in the back, but they're triggered at different times. For example, you know, as you said, through memories, through experiences. I don't think about the same thing all the time. For example, I was actually going to give an example since we're talking about loss. Actually, a real example where. I love flowers because of, of course they're colorful and I prefer the brighter flowers. So white colored flowers, I, they don't excite me too much because I prefer the yellows and the reds and the pinks. 
But then when my granddad died, me and my cousins, we had to make the wreath and we had to use the I think, chrysanthemums. I think I said, hopefully I said that right, to make it. And I had some on my, on my balcony because I grow flowers and I never appreciated them as much as I did before. But having that experience with my cousins making the wreath for my granddad and I just had this new appreciation for the chrysanthemums and I was like, I will always grow these flowers. I, I like these flowers now. I understand, like, now I have a whole other association when I look at those flowers compared to what I had beforehand. So I think it is quite interesting that even if there is a colour that you like, obviously going back to pink again, if, for example, something happened in my life where perhaps I lost someone and the last thing they were wearing that day might have been a pink jumper, I may look at that colour completely different. So I, I find that quite interesting. And I, 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 I agree with you. And I find that uh, we change with color. Of course, we, we hopefully we evolve. <laughs> and um, for instance, brown was not a color that I enjoyed when I was younger. And I, as I move on, and of course our skin changes and, and, and the tone. And so I find that I enjoy now looking at brown. I don't know if I wear much brown, um, but it's not a color that I enjoyed before. And I, uh, it refers me to, I, I think of my, um, the sister who's closest to me who just had her um, floors done in brown and it's, it's smashing, it's beautiful. Yet it's not a color that I enjoy, enjoyed, that I enjoy a little more, but looking at this, these, this, this floor, I think it's beautiful. So I, I think we associate, um, our, as you said, our, our likes with, uh, I want, we, I associate colors with things, yes. And um, it fluctuates. I want to just uh, make my own brief association, if I may. Thank you both for your, for your very rich answers. So many ideas, so many, so many meanings happening in my mind. If I go back to the Brantner, the abstract painting that we looked at during, during Louise's um, guided visit, and I think of my first meanings or associations when it first came up on the screen, a screen, and then I look at the title, The Storm, and immediately I'm thinking of uh, a fall windy day and of leaves turning together and these colors sort of swirling together. So this kind of natural force that's coming in and turning all these colors together and maybe this little glint of red, that, that, that last maple leaf that, oh, that appears. But then Louise tells me what the artist had experienced. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, okay, so we're thinking about the First World War. We're thinking about where he came from culturally going into that experience, but what he would have witnessed. And the storm starts to take on a whole new meaning. And that meaning starts to change concurrently. And my fall scene doesn't disappear. That's the leaves are still turning around in the background there. But then I have to project myself into meaning that I have no direct association with. I never lived through the First World War. I don't have those associations. But the, the story connects me with something empathic. And I try to imagine what was that like for the artist and how does this painting now tell that story? Mm -hmm. And those meanings are sitting side by side. And suddenly this one by one painting is much huger than it was. Mm. There's something very interesting. Um, I, I was mentioning to, to uh, some friends about this. There, there's several studies that show after we go from the level right of the memories and the experience that, that, that feed our brain, let's say that this is like our basic box of materials that we use. The brain use um, different circuits that will do this connection and association between things. For example, uh, the brain use an area of the cortex that's called the insula that is located kind of here in the side kind of entering there. And this association cortex, what it does is when you're exposed to something that is disgusting, let's say you open your fridge and you have a sandwich that you forgot for a month, you just see the sandwich and that part of your brain send a potent message telling your brain and your, the rest of your body, eh, this is really bad, disgusting. It's actually kind of the source of disgust. And what it does is protect you. So it, it elicits the emotion of disgust. What is very interesting is the same area of the brain get active when you observe colors or textures that are disgusting to you. 
Like for example, if, if, if your favorite color is pink, but your non-favorite color is yellow, when you see yellow, that part of your cortex will tell to the rest of you eh, because we'll associate with different experience. Meanwhile, there's another area of the brain that is associated with fear that is called amygdala. And every time that you are in a situation of risk or you have to put attention in something, particularly because it's kind of life of death, this area activates also. And it's kind of inside below your brain, there are two little things. Uh, and it's been associated mostly with fear, but do many other things more. What is interesting is when you observe colors are pleasant and beautiful, that area of the brain get active. So uh, it is very interesting how, how these areas that are strong associated with emotions are also strong associated with activation for color or the harmonious you know, composition of colors and how both of them are also have a strong relations to uh, memories. Uh, they have connection directly where we make the memories and we establish them. So I, I thought it was interesting to mention to you too guys also mm -hmm. in terms of association. I have a, a question that I've been sitting with um, in my in my own um, experience of the visit that I'd like to to ask Louise if it's all right. Which is, um, it's it's funny that you referenced not being able to sit in front of uh, an artwork for hours. I don't have this capacity either, whether when I was twenty years younger or, or even today. So I often return to artworks to to kind of. Um, uh, refresh my experience of them, or to, to add to the duration that I've experienced them. In the time that you spent looking at the artworks for the visit, which one would you say changed the most for you from your first impressions to now presenting them? Mm -hmm. Branders, for sure. Especially the, 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 given the size, how do you contain a storm in a... Yeah. Uh, in a, such a small um, pashad almost. Um, and, and the fact that I, I found that it was very disorderly at, at first, uh, uh, it was almost disturbing. It, it still is. Now I know why, or I, I think I know why. And, uh, and I see what the purpose of, of, of red is in that, in that a painting. If there was no red, I don't think it would be so dramatic. Uh, it probably wouldn't turn as fast. The impetus wouldn't be the same. So this is what really struck me. Um, and, and this is what is fascinating, and I'm sure all of you do that when you, all of us who are connected right now uh, on this, this, this webinar, is we, we look at some, we look at a piece of art, uh, we look at a work, and uh, I often find that I like or dislike work, the, the works that I see. And the, the, when I study more, when I do more research, the ones I love, I, I really love a lot. And the ones I didn't like, I really like them. I, I find that my, my appetite um, grows for, for any piece of work that I, I, I go into and that I, I study. Because we give it, we again, we give it purpose. We understand who, why this person did this, and and uh, their heart really is is the heart's the artist's heart is on on the canvas. In this case, it was a panel, which is even harder. I didn't mention that. So it's an oil on panel, which is you know hard. It's not soft. It's not a canvas. And I find I find also that that aspect of it uh, quite uh, fascinating. Thank you. Do we can see those? Because I remember that many of those artworks are in the in the archives. So what happened if we want to see them one day? Uh, I know right now that um, Collins and McNichols are on uh, the same level yeah. uh, in the Pavillon Bourgie. Um, and Brander, I don't remember seeing, so I'm not sure I could inquire about this and we could uh, post something to uh, the webinar or to Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice to see it in person. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> so, okay, uh, it's 2.20, 
So if anyone have a further last question, you can post it now, ask it directly, or then that's it <laughs> for today. <laughs> so any other further question? I want to invite you in the meantime for uh, our next colloquium, which is in, um, I'll tell you right away, it's called Uranium Yellow. It's going to be in June 19. Uh, that's a Saturday at 1 p.m. We will have Oscar Gonzalez Mendia, a chemist from Spain, who will speak to us about toxicity in colors. And we will have also Christian Udon, uh, a Montreal Museum of an Arts volunteer guy who will be guiding us through three works uh, that have been selected from the museum that have this fantastic topic in them. So toxicity in the color. So please, you can register right away if you want, go to the Convergence website. There's the site for, for, for that. And next weekend, uh, next Sunday, as yes. I told you in, in early today, is our workshop with Darian Golian Stahl, who is here there in, in uh, the, the chat. So she will be guiding you guys through the social construct of colors and names and how they affect the, the perspective of how you see the color. It's going to be really, really fun. So um, register, just go to the website and get registered and we will see you next week. So I, I would like to just say a quick word. I would like to thank uh, um, people who joined us from Colombia. Who's, who's from Colombia? Uh, somebody who mentioned hello from Colombia at the very top. Oh. Muy bien, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Sí. Super. Bienvenida, eh, es una mujer. Es una mujer. Sí. Muy bien, gracias por venir y, sí. y totalmente invitada a la siguiente sesión en junio. So, anyone else want to say something? Dominica, Luis, Stefan. Great experience. Thank you so much for inviting me. I feel very privileged again. And it was great to uh, get to know you, Duenica. And Christian and Stephen. <laughs> Thank you as well. I mean, this was incredible. I feel like I've, I didn't realize how personal, because you know, it's, I started talking about research, but then when you really reflect and obviously think about social constructs, it gets personal because color is a part of our everyday life because I said we can we can see it and we use it as well. And as I said, just a thought when I was even using the picture of the signs in color in our in our social world is that color helps us survive. It helps us navigate. And I think it just gives you a new appreciation for the different colors that we can see as well. And certain objects that we can see in certain colors because we know for other species they see certain objects as different colors as well so it was just really interesting and made sure I was why do we have to perceive that specific wavelength to that specific object and it's just it makes you think as you well people like me I, I'll, I'll think when I walk on the road now and I see certain buildings or architecture and just see color with with material as well it's just it just makes me think about why this color was chosen and what what does it mean to me and how could this differ for other people as well? So thank you so much for making me think, I think, today. <laughs> I'd like to express my own gratitude. Dwenica, thank you so much for joining us all the way from London today. Uh, wishing you a good evening there. And um, we'll be watching with keen interest as your research inv uh, evolves. And congratulations once again on your funding. I hope thank this is not the last time we get to collaborate with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Luis, thank you so much for sharing uh, your love, your research, uh, and for, gosh, giving us the opportunity even virtually to go back into a gallery again. It was really rich <laughs> and we're grateful to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Dominica, I learned so much today. I'm going to ask you for all those references. I want to use them in class. They're super, super cool. I, I just can't imagine how, how cool this is going to go in vision class. It's really, really nice. Luis, I just love this journey to the paintings again i just love to to see the details the little scenes and and get in the mood when you are in front of the painting and for the new knowledge i mean for, learn about magnicol and and the story of, of brandner is really really changed as you say the 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 perspective of how i see those paintings and those painters so that was absolutely amazing thank you so much stefan as usual thank you for being here great team thank you, thank you.
And thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you, everyone. For those of you in Montreal, go enjoy the sunshine and, and notice the colors out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bye to everyone. See you next Bye. week for uh, Darren, uh, Dr. Darren Stahl's um, workshops. <laughs>